asthma diagnosis is the topic and uh, asthma can occur because of a wide variety of causes some of the more common include allergens and um, perinatal factors such as prematurity and uh, low birth weight and uh, there's a lot of other reasons as well that the person can develop asthma and uh, environmental causes as well now the fundamental pathophysiology of asthma involves two things the first is that you have this inflammation in your airway and then the next of course is bronchoconstriction and these two things uh, can happen again and again and some of the triggers include uh, infections exercise sometimes in certain populations and sometimes inhaled irritants and those inhaled irritants include uh, cigarette smoke pollution in the environment as well and then when a person does present with asthma the classic symptoms are difficulty breathing wheezing uh, a person can also have a cough and then their respiratory rate can go up tachypnea increased respiratory rate so what I wanted to concentrate on uh, in this video is the diagnosis and the first thing I wanted to discuss are lung volumes so I'm going to draw a diagram here this part at the bottom is time and this uh, section of the graph is the volume and draw some lines here they're really supposed to be dotted lines Three and then four so each of these represents something so this one right here is the residual volume RV and the residual volume is essentially the amount of air that's left in your lungs when a person has exhaled as completely as possible so air left in lungs after max exhale so after you've taken the maximum possible exhale what's left in the lungs so there's always some uh, air left in the lungs the next one is this one right here which is the ERV which is the expiratory reserve volume now the expiratory reserve volume is a very important one and that's the maximum volume that can be breathed out that can be exhaled so that's very important the next one right here is the TV which is the tidal volume and the tidal volume essentially is the volume of air that moves in and out of your lungs during regular breathing so air in lungs during regular breathing and then the top one right here is the IRV which is very similar to the ERV except this involves inspiratory measurements inspiratory reserve volume so the inspiratory reserve volume is essentially the maximum volume that can be inhaled so this squiggly line with the red is how things w look normally when you're breathing now if you take the maximum deep breath it'll go up to here and then if you exhale maximally it'll go down to here 
And that's about as much as I wanted to tell you in this graph without getting things too complicated. It's not that difficult to understand. So you got the residual volume, ERV, TV, and IRV. Now, here's the take-home point in asthma. And I'll uh, use it with a, a big, a more thicker marker. In asthma, a person can't exhale maximally. So this ERV can't be as dramatic as this diagram because there's bronchoconstriction. So air is also trapped inside the lungs. So because of bronchoconstriction, you can't take a, a maximum amount of air outside. You can't breathe it out. So you can't exhale as maximally. So instead of having this dramatic, you'll have something like this. So you see what happened there? The ERV is not as uh, dramatic. And also, if the ERV is not as big, did you notice what happened to the RV? The RV is now up to here. So the RV has increased. The residual volume has increased. There's air being trapped inside the lungs. And also, a person with asthma can't exhale maximally. Okay, so we got RV here. Here we have... ERV, here we have TV, and here we have IRV. Okay, so normally you've got this tidal volume, and then when a person takes the maximum deep breath, it goes up, and when the person exhale maximally, it goes down. In asthma, you have a situation where it looks something like this, like that. So what that does is essentially makes the residual volume greater increased residual volume for two reasons really the first is that the person with asthma cannot exhale maximally so we can't get this uh, ERV as big as in a normal person and then also uh, in asthma the air is trapped inside the lungs adding to the residual volume so that's the first take-home point the next take-home point is the fact that you have something that's also measured known as FEV1 and this is very important so remember this part of the graph is time and this part of the graph is volume and I'll break it up into one second two seconds three seconds four seconds like that well what I'm trying to show in this diagram is something like this So someone is essentially exhaling out and they're trying to exhale as much as possible so the, the maximum amount of air they can exhale out in asthma. Well notice what happens at the one second point we've reached here and that is a measured value known as FEV1, forced expiratory volume in one second. And that's very important uh, lung volume that's measured in asthma. Now, the next one that you measure is right here. When the person completes their uh, exhale, then you measure, and that is FVC, forced vital capacity. Now, in asthma, what you have to do is you have to measure this before you give any treatments. So you measure the FEV1, and then what you do is you give a bronchodilator, bronchodilator treatment. And this is a very important diagnostic point in asthma. If the person indeed has asthma, the FEV1 will improve. And in particular, it should improve by greater than 12%. So after treatment, it would be something like this. Like that. So if you see the FEV1 now, FEV1 at one second is now a little bit bigger. Now when that happens, that is known as reversible airway 
disease. So you have reversible obstruction. And that's a very important diagnostic uh, criteria of asthma. If there's an improvement of FEV1 greater than 12% uh, in response to bronchodilator treatment, it confirms this reversible airway obstruction. And uh, that's really the main thing about the lung volumes that I wanted to tell you about. I hope that it wasn't too confusing. Um, it's really not supposed to be confusing. It's just uh, important to understand instead of just memorizing FEV1 and all those things. The next part of the uh, diagnostic uh, testing or uh, implementation of analysis uh, in asthma is ABG, which is arterial blood gases. Now, arterial blood gases are very important because they're oftentimes used in patients that have a lot of respiratory distress or symptoms and they look like they might be going into respiratory failure. So there's three components of the ABGs. The first one is the PaCO2, the next one is the pH, and the next one is the PaO2. And the normal values, uh, PaCO2 is about 40, pH is about 7.4, and Oxygen, well, it should be 100, right? But, I mean, technically greater than 85 is okay. So what happens in asthma? Well, in asthma, at least in the acute phase, the respiratory rate goes up because the person is hyperventilating. Now, when that goes up, the person blows off CO2. And when the person blows off CO2, this number goes down. So, for example, it might go down to 20 instead of being normal at 40. Now, that creates some consequences. So, if a person is uh, experiencing an acute asthma attack, the respiratory rate will be high, they blow off the CO2, and then the, rest, the PaCO2 goes down. Now, there is an inverse relationship between pH and CO2, meaning as one goes up, the other one goes down. So if the CO2 goes down, the pH goes up. So the pH might be 7.5. Okay? So what this is essentially is a state of respiratory, which is this part, and this part is alkalosis. So that's very important to remember. And this is just one of the very many scenarios in an ABG, but I just wanted to concentrate on this one uh, just to explain very briefly the uh, ABGs in an acute asthma attack. And here we go with some clinical vignettes. An 18-year-old girl complains of symptoms of an upper respiratory tract infection for one to two days, followed by an increase in shortness of breath and greater use of inhaled bronchodilators for treatment of her chronic stable asthma. She presents to the ER with increased use of accessory muscles of ventilation, tachypnea, and wheezing. Shortly after the symptoms of her asthma attack are resolved, PFTs uh, testing is done. Most likely will show which of the following. Well, remember that big long conversation when I told you that in a person with asthma, they can't uh, exhale maximally due to bronchoconstriction, and also air is trapped inside the lungs. So all those things contribute to an increased residual volume. And that is conveniently listed as choice C. And then finally, a 23-year-old woman comes to the emergency room because of severe asthma flare. She reports that over the past hour she has progressively more difficulty breathing and that her medications at home have not helped her. She has a seven-year history of asthma with multiple hospitalizations. She was last hospitalized three years ago for a severe flare that required inpatient therapy with corticosteroids. Current meds include albuterol four times a day, oral leukotriene inhibitors, chromalin, theophylin. Temperature is 98, blood pressure is 160, pulse is 90, and respirations are 32. 
Her breath sounds are scant with prolonged expiratory phase. She appears to be moving minimal air. Albuterol and hypertropium nebulizers are initiated, and ABG, arterial blood gas, is drawn and most likely will show. Okay, well, first thing I noticed that her respiratory rate is very high, right? I mean, normal is between 12 to 20, 16 being the average. So she's blowing off a lot of CO2. So that's going to mean her PaCO2 will be low. Now, normal PaCO2 is about 40, so it'll be less than 40. Uh, actually, normal is between 35 and 45 for PaCO2. I think it's important for me to mention that. So that eliminates C, D, and E, because we want to see a patient who has an ABG with a low PaCO2 because of her hyperventilation. So that really just leaves choices A and B. Now, remember, this is an acute event. So what happens to the pH? Well, remember, the pH has an inverse relationship with CO2. As one goes up, the other goes down. If the PaCO2 has gone down, the pH will go up. So normal pH is, again, uh, between 7.35 and 7.45. So you want to see that the pH has gone up. And the only one is right here. So these two are the only ones that fit. You don't even have to look at the PaO2, interestingly, even though they give you them in both of the choices, but choice B is the only one that matches. So this is an acute event, and she is in a state of respiratory, respiratory alkalosis. Choice B is the correct answer.